Hello. Okay. Hey, welcome to History Chats this afternoon. Um, we're going to get started in a couple minutes here. Hope you're having a, a, a wonderful uh, day so far. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to talking about some um, some some interesting stories. With the the oral history project of the DC Everest School District. Um, yeah, just gonna make sure everything is working. If you're watching after the fact, you feel free to skip ahead a little bit if you want to. Um, while we while we just kind of let people join, and um, get in. If you're watching live, we're going to get started in about two or three minutes here. But uh, I'm just going to continue making sure that everything is working. And yeah, cool. Um, I guess while we're waiting, um, always good to do this stuff. So, so this week, um, oh, didn't see that yet. So we're, we're wrapping up our um, People You Should Know, um, which is the topic that we've been doing this month. Uh, we, were, we were hoping to get a special guest to speak to this, this, this project, um, the Oral History Project from the D.C. Everest School District. Um, and unfortunately, we were unable to make it work with schedules and, and you know, health concerns and stuff like that that's happening uh, to the people who are involved necessarily, um, which, is, which is understandable. So... Um, we don't necessarily get to have the reveal of who is the secret special guest. It's, it's just Gary and I, uh, but we are going to, um, tell the story anyway. Um, and, but yeah, this, this wraps up June. So we're going to get into July next week and we're going to be talking about, um, a little, little interesting story, the unincorporated places of Marathon County. Um, you know, there's, there's villages and cities and, and townships there's also little communities, those little hamlets, those little crossroads um, that, that exist that, that are their own community, but they, they're not large enough. They haven't incorporated into a, a proper municipality necessarily. And um, so we're going to take a look at four of those over the course of the next month. Um, Bevent, Halder, Ponatuski, and Knowlton. Um, so yeah, just a little opportunity to get to know the, 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 the county, a little bit of the, the places here, some some places we don't usually touch on. Um, so that'll be what we're doing next month. Um, speaking of which, um, so so Gary's actually going to be doing a, a, the, the front load of this uh, because I'm going to be getting ready for our his next History Speaks, um, which is coming up on the July 16th, so coming up pretty quick here, um, the History of Wausau. So we are celebrating 150 years as a city um, in, in 2022. And so it felt like a good opportunity to talk about, you know, what's the history of the city of Wausau. So, um, you know, it said back in the 1800s, they, you know, an observer observed, said that of Wausau that we were conscious of a brilliant, of, of a brilliant future. And so I figured, hey, let's, let's look into that. How did we get to become a city and, and where does that develop? So that'll be coming up again. That'll be on Saturday, July 16th. Um, if you're interested in learning about that. Okay. But I think um, it's about time here, so we're going to get started. All right. So here's Gary and I. Um, I'm going to be doing the first half here, um, and then um, I'll hand it over for Gary to talk more about the uh, the project itself. So, um, yeah, we're talking about oral history, an oral history project. And um, you, you may be you're watching this, you maybe don't know what is an oral history. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting... Uh, development, not some, well, it, well, I figured let's give you an overview of it. Um, so to start, um, you know, oral histories are essentially a way of telling history through talking, right? Um, there are sources that say that, you know, you, you could trace this, this process of using histories that have, through interviews uh, back to, you know, the Greek, the ancient Greeks, Herodotus and Thucydides, um, you know, apparently made extensive use of interviews to tell the stories of you know, what happened during that time. And over the years, you know, most history, or, or a good chunk of the history, certainly in the Western world, certainly like sort of the American historiography, what, what American historians have done, really depend a lot on the written word. You know, we, we, we will use oral interviews, you know, talking to people to get perspective, but, you know, it, it, is it, people can be mis misleading and all of that. So there's a period, you know, by the 1800s where we start to say, no, we have to look at the record. You know, we have to have the sources that back this up. 
Um, and so we're, we're kind of biased in some ways towards the, that written material. Um, but in a lot of places, um, they don't have necessarily that ability. Um, you know, you talk like the Native Americans. Uh, many Native American tribes don't have an extensive written, you know, catalog of their history. They're, the way that they tell stories is that's how they keep the history alive. And, and they remain, you know, the, the, for, for many um, Wisconsin tribes, um, an important part of the culture and the traditions. <coughs> and similarly, you know, there are a lot of other groups that you can include in this across the world, um, you know, relevant to, to, to our community. You know, the Hmong certainly um, don't necessarily have a long history of written histories of, of their families, of their experience, of their, their culture. Um, it's, it's very much, you know, spoken and, and passed down that way. Um, and of course, the experience of being refugees, you, you just can't, even if they did have, you know, volumes of, of stuff, you know, if you're fleeing from your life, for your life with your family, um, you don't get to bring that. So, you know, oral histories can be a way that, that or, or the process of, of talking through history can be helpful to keep these stories alive in many cases. And I think even in the Western world, even in American culture, right, um, this is a, a transcript of an, um, a, a little bit of a speech given by um, a sermon during the, the uh, Reverend Eastwood of the First Presbyterian Church. I think this is like 19, around 1920. And for Memorial Day, he said something like, um, it's a good thing for a nation to, uh, to make much of its heroes and to keep alive the old days and the old inspiration. When an old soldier dies, there is a historian lost, for in every soldier is history not found in books, and oral history is often the most important. When you get a veteran to talk, we learn of history recorded nowhere else, for great deeds are often unknown except in the small circle. And certainly veterans are a good example of this, of, of there's a lot of stuff that happens in war that doesn't get written down. It, it, it won't be in the history books. Um, but those acts of valor or, or just, you know, the experience of, of doing it is something that, you know, that those people lived through it. And so we should, we should value that. Um, so even, even before oral histories become sort of widespread in the, in the, the profession of, of historians, you know, people still recognize that people that lived through things have a perspective that nobody else can bring to the table. So a couple things change this and lead to the development of the, the process of oral histories. Um, <clears throat> in part, I mean, people have been having interviews with people for a long time, but you have to, you, you know, if you're, if you're being engaging and having a conversation with someone, you can't just write every single word down. So they have to be selective. But when you have recording technology, particularly recording technology, like this is a wire recorder, this becomes uh, kind of feasible to, to take out in the field and you can get a, a good, you know, using the magnetic wires. Um, later, this gets replaced by tapes, um, which, you know, the precursors to a lot of like the VHSs and, and cassette tapes and magnetic, you know, going back all that way. Um, this allows for people to go out into the field and, and, and to visit people and to set up, a, you know, record. A, it's a lot, a lot better than having to bring like a, a portable wax cylinder, you know, to, to this is pretty good. And so by the middle, you know, the 1930s, 40s, these become pretty reasonable to, to, to take out there. They're pretty reliable. And so you have the ability to get the spoken word. I mean, part of the problem with transcriptions are they're, they're really great because you don't have to, you can kind of read as you, you know, skim and things like that, but you lose a little bit. Sometimes you want to hear the inflection in the voice of what somebody is saying and how they're saying it. You know, some you lose that if it's just a written word or if somebody's interpreting that and on the page, you know, there's other perspectives that kind of muddy the waters. And so if you can just, you know, flip a switch and hear somebody's voice in their own words, it becomes very, very useful. And then just because you have the technology, then you have people that are starting to use it. Um, and, and a great example of this is, is in the 1930s during the Depression, um, as part of the, the New Deal, um, you know, Roosevelt, you know, creates all of these things to put people to work. And there's the writers um, projects, the, the federal writers projects. And one of the things they do, you know, in addition to, you know, all sorts of other, you know, keeping writers in, um, you know, for, for example, like, I, th I think this, this particular graphic is, is the sort of thing that it was, um, you know, they might tr um, get a, a group of writers to go out and, and, you know, create a description of like, here's what this community is, or like for, for tourism or to document things. And, 
And, and one of the ways they do this is they go out and they talk to people and often you know, record transcriptions or uh, record the, the conversations and transcribe them. And so there's this generation, you know, particularly in the 30s, where they recognize you know, there are people that are still around who remember slavery as it, you know, that were slaves, um, that fought in the Civil War, that had this perspective that they knew was going to disappear as, as time would go on. And so, hey, let's get those, those, those perspectives. And then from the historian side of things, um, and, and here I'm, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, Alan Nevins often gets the credit here. Um, he and a group of people from Columbia uh, University, um, he, he's, he's a historian and a writer in his own right, but he gets credit for, um, in some ways, uh, taking this model and, and really making history based on oral interviews. That he goes out and he talks to people and he sits down with these interviews and he transcribes them and then that becomes the basis for some of the works that he does. And biographies about high you know, profile people in the United States, you know, presidents and war heroes and um, you know, that sort of thing. And um, granted, the, the source that I, 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 you know, it's quoted, if you go to like the Wikipedia page or, you know, on, on the internet, um, Columbia, um, the Columbia Encyclopedia credits him and he worked for Columbia University. I don't know if that's a conflict of interest, but I think it, it, certainly there's a generation that, that, that comes of age or that, that is, is active at this point in time in the 30s and 40s of historians who see this as a useful method. And this is only going to continue, especially by like the 60s and 70s, when you start to see people that are starting to look at like, maybe we should, you know, talk to people so that we can get the stories of, um, you know, African Americans or women or, you know, people who minorities who, for whatever reason, their stories don't go back to the written work that we are trying to use up to this point. So um, oral history becomes a, you know, by the 50s, 60s, 70s, increasingly becomes a very, very useful tool, um, no matter what you're, you're doing, talking to people, it's, it's a great way to create a primary source. Uh, there are limitations here, I don't want to get too deep into the, the, the um, discussion about what oral history projects are and, and what you do with them, but um, it, they start to get used here too. A um, great example of this for the American Bicentennial in 1976, um, there is a nationwide you know, push to say, hey, you should talk to people. And, <coughs> excuse me, you can see, so this, for example, in, in 1974, two years before the celebration, you know, they're already sending up workshops to say, hey, here's how to do this. And this leads to, in, in, in Marathon County, a whole committee designed to try and sum up the history. Uh, you know, uh, Louis Marchetti had done a great job writing that book back in 1913. What happened since? And we need to fill in that gap. And so there was a book that was created, um, that, or at least commissioned, and then they also wanted to do these oral interviews. And so uh, local community members went out and they talked to, you know, people who owned businesses and politicians, but also, you know, farm wives and people that worked at the switch operators at the phone station, you know, telephone company. Um, they, they tried to get just a good swath of the population. Um, and, and it's was pretty successful and, and great because this is actually, you know, the, the bulk of these interviews are really, I mean, we use them all the time for exhibits and programs because they, they really tell stories that we wouldn't know otherwise. And in the words of the people that lived it. So, yeah. Now it's worth noting it just to kind of bring us to DC Everest, cause that's what we're, we're talking about here. Um, when we talk about terminology, that doesn't necessarily mean just because you have an oral tradition that oral histories are the same. I, this is maybe a little bit of a pedantic thing. Um, I know a lot of historians or scholars get a little, well, I'll give you an example. If you go on the internet and you try to find oral histories, you might find, for example, <coughs> um, uh, the video game website polygon.com, right? They did a, an oral interview. It's a whole thing where they went through about the Final Fantasy games and they, they talked to people and they did a lot of interviews and they created this, this great thing. It ended up getting published as a book. It's not really an oral history though. It is a history using oral sources, which might seem pedantic, but other examples here being um, back in 2020, uh, crew and, and actors and people from the, the office, the television show, um, they did a podcast where they talked about their, you know, the office and they called it the oral, an oral history. But this isn't really a history. This is just people. It's, it's, it's the whole point that I want to just kind of make is that, um, you know, it's not just creating an end product. It's not just, Hey, here's the book that we created through this oral history is also 
a larger uh, process of um, getting people involved and doing the interviews, and those create sources on themselves that may not be as interesting in their entirety. They might not be something you could publish a book and sell that way, um, but that's also an important part of it. And this is something that when we get to now, the DC Everest um, back in, in um, 1998, <coughs> excuse me, um, some of the faculty, um, kind of led by Paul Ellickson at the DC Everest um, School District, in the social studies department, they, they realized that, you know, hey, there's there's a, an opportunity here. Um, they, they credited, it, well, Paul credits, he's done some interviews in, in the past where he talks about how, you know, for the, in, in, in and I can't remember if it was the, the county's 150th or if it was the state of Wisconsin's 150th, but around, you know, the late 90s, they were, we were celebrating history, local people, and you know, there wasn't much, you know, considering the Hmong community that was so new to the, you know, here, but become important, he felt like there was this, this gap. And so they thought, well, let's get students to go out and talk to the Hmong community and we can write down that story. And so that first edition came out in 1999. And over the years, um, you know, they did it as, as far as we know, we, I, I think it ended, the last one was in 2018. Um, they did 26 of them. Because they, they talked to the Hmong, and then they went, oh, well, World War II veterans, let's talk to them, because they're kind of disappearing, and there's a story there. And then, you know, uh, Gary's going to talk more specifically about what's in them. But I just wanted to say, like, the scale of this is really cool. Um, and it's not just, you know, a handful of students involved. They're, over the course of this project, this became really an important um, teaching tool for, um, and, and part of the curriculum in the English department and the, the history department and, you know, <coughs> Excuse me. Kids, the, the the kids in the middle school and high school got a chance to, you know, learn about you know this aspect of history, um, and to do it themselves, and then create a book and and you know write articles about it, and and I think that that's something that um, is really important because to, so frequently the the way that we teach history is well look in the textbook and recite these dates and names and what happens. But real history is this process. It's going out and talking to people and making sense of it and, and understanding the community. So um, it's, a larger, it's a larger community effort from the, 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 the school district and, and the community that took part. And, and as a result, we got all of these, um, these stories of people that are um, included in them. Okay, well, I think at this point, I'm gonna um, Make sure everything. Yeah, let's 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 um, send it over to Gary, um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the specific books. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, well, and I think this Ben gave us an excellent introduction to what oral history is. It's interviews, it's individual stories, but these all these stories come together to form larger stories. Um, that um, and we'll talk a, a few of these today. Uh, as Ben mentioned uh, back in in '98, in '19, um, the Everest people decided to start these oral histories with regard to, and they they started with the with this book, the Hmong oral histories from the Hmong of Central Wisconsin, and this and this is sort of how it started um, using. A lot of different help from a variety of different funding sources, the staff involvement and the student involvement. And I think it's important that as this whole large movement, this um, movement of oral interviews has, has been described, really started here uh, in the Everest School District. It, it involved a lot of staff, uh, a brief from the beginning of this volume we can see the staff involvement. It also involved um, other community involvement. So it was a large issue rather than, it's a larger than just sending out students to interview people, but they incorporated the whole community. Jim Lawrence from the university was heavily involved. Uh, people from on this volume from the Hmong Association were, were also involved as well as staff from the Everest School District, Christian Amon, uh, a variety of teachers um, that were involved with the Everest School District, not only the senior high, but also as well as the junior high. So a lot of people, but
But the key ingredient was the student involvement as Ben was leading on to. So here we have these students charged with going out and interviewing Hmong people in this community. So it would be interesting to see how these uh, students at this time came away from this experience. So hopefully they may have been involved with uh, other oral histories to come, but they, but, they, but they were the initial students that took it upon themselves to put together um, this book. And I, after this is a little bit of the, of the, time, of the, of the nature of the book itself, the project beginning. So there, the, it was a clear message to the reader that the, the project, the Hmong and the migration, the, those stories, those history stories. So it, as Ben was saying, it's good to have the interviews, which we have now, but it's also the next step is to create that history. So we create that history from these interviews, and this is a part of what they did on this first volume. So they created a timeline. Um, they created an historical timeline. Uh, it goes on to talk about the Hmong timeline um, in, central, uh, in Asia as well as in central Wisconsin. And also the context of what Laos looked like. So what's the context of this culture that the Hmong people were bringing from Southeast Asia into central Wisconsin? So the, it's, a, it's a cultural, it's the beginning of a cultural approach really to, to these oral histories that, that we will be talking a little bit about. Ben mentioned all of the, all of the, seri all of the, the books involved. I'm just gonna be talking about a few of them, but it will hopefully give you a little bit of a perspective on what is in these. And, and the people involved. So Peter Yang, Mr. Yang was one of the people that were in, was interviewed for this. So we have his story, um, you know, born in, in uh, Vientiane province, coming to America, eventually becoming a, a leader of the Wausau Area Hmong Association, an invaluable resource in telling the story of his journey so his journey, along with other journeys that were a part of this, all becomes a part of a larger Hmong cultural history in central Wisconsin. So, so with, with that volume, as well as the, um, uh, some future volumes, the Hmong in, in the modern world, and the Hmong and their stories, come together to form a history, really, an extensive history through these individual lives of what, of the, the Hmong story in Southeast Asia, as well as coming and their journey to central Wisconsin. That story is yet to be, to be written. I mean, we now have the the resource, the primary sources, the sources that some future historian can come back and write that history. So if there's master's degree people looking for resources, primary sources, we now have those interviews that tell that story. Also at this same time, the Everest, um, people were looking at future oral histories. And at that time, it came upon them that they were, that veterans of World War II were starting to pass away, that those stories were becoming fewer and fewer. And so they took it upon themselves, and there are more uh, World War II books after this is their first one, but there were more World War II stories coming uh, after this book. Uh, but for instance, the story of Les Schwarm. So we were a part, central Wisconsin was a part of the larger, the larger war, the larger World War, 
we sent our young people off uh, to Europe, to the Pacific Theater, uh, Italy, North Africa. They were involved with a variety of other theaters and people from central Wisconsin went off. They came back and the Everest students took it upon themselves. So let's talk to these people. One of these was Les Schwarm, who um, grew up in Wausau. He was a glider trooper, a, you know, a unique story unto himself for Les. And there's many, and um, the Everest uh, Oral History Project did, a, I think, several volumes on World War II um, veterans. Of course, they also then expanded into other wars, the Korean War, the Gulf War, and I believe, I think, I don't know if there was a, Iraq. Via, there, Iraq, and then also, of course, a large volume on the Vietnam War. So, again, stories, individual stories of central Wisconsin people uh, becoming part of the larger war effort uh, of this nation. The Everest Oral History Project also took it upon themselves eras in American history. Uh, one of the, uh, perhaps one of the more meaningful eras um, in, in American history is the Great Depression in the 19, beginning in 1929 and moving into the beginning of World War II. But this was, this was a very influential part of American history and then, of course, it was also an important part of central Wisconsin's history. So here we have the story of Emily Borth, who grew up on the northeast side of Wausau, born in 1915, 14 years old when, when the market crashed. And the, so as a teenager, she witnessed the, the effects of the Great Depression. And, and this is her story. And I think one of the, the, the quotes that she she is highlighted there on the bottom left. The first thing I think of as being a young girl is that I had one dress to wear. I wore it every day to school and come Saturday, uh, take it off, wash it and iron it. So that, and of course her story goes on for several pages, but I'm just, it again, it again reveals how individual people lived. And, and of course that story of the Great Depression uh, has been manifested in several books, uh, several books with regard to Wausau and Marathon County. But again, to that historian who wants to look and see what the Great Depression meant and how people lived in the Great Depression, uh, this would be one of those volumes that dealt with that. The the Everest. Um, oral History Project took on different sort of specialized, let me say specialized books. One was Local Voices, Stories of Wausau Past and Present, where incorporated a variety of people living. Um, of course, they were uh, um, at that time um, and reflecting on their history. And one one interview that I want to call attention to is the interview with Arden Hoffman, who grew up in um, the town, I believe in the town of Rip Falls on a farm. But then his story was that he came, came to Wassa, became a teacher, witnessed a lot of, of educational history in, in Wassa, in addition to his growing up on a family farm in the town of Vermont. So a unique story that I think uh, tells the story across different, across different lines, across different individual stories, across individual histories. Uh, Arne Hoffman, um, a key educator in the city of Wausau for many, for many years. Another volume that speaks to a little bit to the larger hometown stories. I think the the hometown stories is a key title to this because it goes into a variety of different people that are new to the community as well as people that may have left the community and gone on to other things. And one of those folks is John McCutcheon, folk singer, songwriter, uh, grew up in Wausau, 
I believe he went to St. James Church of the Resurrection School uh, when he was growing up. But then he went on to become a pretty noted folk singer, songwriter, writer of books. Uh, he, uh, he came to Wausau quite a, quite a while, quite a while ago, um, and quite often. Um, I'm not sure that he's been in Wausau lately, but again, one of our um, sons of Wausau that really did go on to greater things and his interview is here, growing up in Wassa and, and his life after leaving Wassa. One of the final volumes that I just want to touch on is Heritage and Homeland, Wisconsin's Cultural History, which speaks mostly to the immigra immigration stories that, that are full of people in, in Marathon County, a variety of different immigrant immigrant stories. And one of those stories is Tyler Peer, who started out as a family historian, doing, wanted to tell his story of his family, his ancestors. But what it turned out to be, I mean, he became an historian of the Swiss immigration into central Wisconsin. So he traces his family back to Switzerland coming into the Fox Valley, coming into, into Marathon County, and the importance of the Swiss migration into Wisconsin. It isn't just at Mount Horeb uh, and New Glarus that the Swiss came. They came into the Fox Valley. They came into central Wisconsin, a story that we don't really hear too much about. But Tyler uh, really does really reflect and he and he, which makes him really an historian of of the Swiss, of his family, and of the Swiss migration into this volume also goes, of course, into Asian migration into central Wisconsin, European, African migration into uh, it's a large, but I think, but I just wanted to make point that Tyler's story really does incorporate his whole history of Swiss immigration beginning, beginning in Switzerland. What brought them here? Why did they feel they had to come to, uh, to America? Why did they want to come here, settling here, and then eventually homesteading, working on, working in the factories of uh, Wassa and Schofield? Quite a story. Uh, but again, reflective of the larger stories that are all incorporated into these, all those volumes that Ben made reference to, uh, individual stories morphing into and becoming histories of Wausau, Marathon County, and Central Wisconsin. The larger stories, uh, the women, the woman, the woman volume. Uh, Wisconsin, incorporating a lot of Wisconsin stories. So there's just a lot of different individual stories, all incorporating uh, our history and showing a little bit about what our history is all about. So with that, I turn it back to Ben. Okay, yeah. So there you go. That's um. A Kind of hodgepodge of different stuff here. Um, hopefully you enjoyed. Um, again, the, the, they're, 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 they float out around here. Um, they did a lot of them, as we, we saw. There's 26 different volumes, so they, they covered a lot of ground. And um, yeah, thankfully they did, because there's a lot of these stories that otherwise might have never been told. Or um, and, and again, the experience of being able to get the community involved in doing it. Very great. So... Um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll probably call it there. Um, again, next, next week, we're going to be going to some unincorporated places across Marathon County, uh, for the, the theme for month, the next month. Hope you join us for that. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, have a wonderful week. Um, happy 4th of July. If you're, if you're watching this in the next couple days and, uh, we'll come back, um, in, in the future here to, um, 
talk some more history. So thanks for